All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Um, let's talk about reptiles today and start where I left off last time, which really was just a few minutes ago in my world. Um, who knows what's happening anymore, right? Um, we're, we're doing what we can, uh, but the end is near. We can kind of see it uh, as we move into the last uh, several weeks, which is um, good, I think. Uh, anyway, we're talking about uh, the evolution of reptiles, my favorite group, uh, the, the one, the group that really got me into biology, although I like really all kinds of forms of life um, from bacteria all the way to mammals and birds. It was really the reptiles. As a kid, I was into them, uh, catching them, and they always sort of fascinated me. So in college, um, I sort of made this connection that the things I liked to do as a kid, catching reptiles and looking at them and that kind of thing, could you could do that as an adult, essentially, in some ways. And that's why I became um, Tim Ravel, biology professor, um, because of the reptile. So evolution of the amniotic egg. Um, the egg that you find in reptiles is significantly different than that in amphibians. And it's important. It's a, an important evolutionary difference. Uh, it allows the animals with the amniotic egg to complete their entire life cycle on land. Uh, so the amniotic egg has a shell that retains water um, and it prevents it from drying out. Now, in the case of mammals, which are also amniotes, um, that hard outside shell is lost in evolutionary history, um, but the, the same sort of um, structures that, that are involved with the amniotic egg are still present in the mammals um, with some modifications, except for that hard outside shell. And there are specialized, what we call extra embryonic membranes, extra embryonic, the embryos, the baby, extra embryonic means these membranes are part of the egg. They're not part of the embryo and they are what make the amniotic egg um, uh, viable and able to survive. So this is my typical amniotic egg. Um, I've got um, a shell that is uh, hard. Now, I, I should rephrase that somewhat and be a little more clear. Um, depending on the reptile, the, the egg is in reptiles is kind of more like leathery. It's it's harder by far than an than a say a amphibian egg, uh, but we're not quite talking like a chicken egg hard. Um, it's sort of somewhere in between there, but it's, it's very water resistant, far more water resistant than what we saw in the amphibians. So we have this shell um, and then we have the amnion, the uh, alant, the uh, alantos, the chorion, and then the yolk sac. And we'll go through what each of these do and why they're important. So first, the amnion protects from dehydration and it protects against mechanical shock. So the embryo is surrounded by the amnion and it prevents it from moving around and getting damaged. And it also prevents it from drying out. Uh, the yolk sac is what you might think is it's used for nutrient storage. Uh, the egg is once it is laid by the uh, female, pretty much has to have all the resources in it to complete the development. So the yolk sac is the nutrient storage place that is going to allow the um, baby reptile to continue to grow um, outside the mother. Uh, the albumin is the egg white. Uh, it's also a nutrient storage part. Um, if you were to eat a chicken egg, the egg white is the equivalent of the albumin. Um, the allantos is a... Um, extra embryonic membrane that's used for storing waste and gas exchange. And the chorion is also used for gas exchange. As the animal develop, it's producing waste that has to be stored. Um, otherwise, the animal's exposed to its own waste uh, and it would kill the embryo. So those function for that. We have a, a variety of amniotes we'll talk about as we go through here. Um, and let's first talk about what makes reptiles different than what we saw in the amphibians. So first of all, they have 
they have a tough dry skin. Amphibians are sort of moist and wet, as we talked about, uh, or, or sort of slimy. Um, but reptiles are not. Uh, there's a couple of snakes that live in some very unusual scenarios where they're slimier. But in general, reptiles have smooth, uh, dry skin or bumpy dry skin, but it's usually very dry. They have the amniotic egg, which allows them to lay their eggs on land. So there are many, uh, most reptiles, in fact, that don't need to go to water of any sort. They have stronger jaws, um, better, more powerful crushing and gripping jaws. There's more muscle associated with a skull. Um, they have copulatory organs, which allows them to have internal fertilization uh, so that they, they can't rely on water like frogs to have the sperm and egg sort of um, mix around. So they have to have ways to get the sperm delivered directly into the female uh, with more and efficient um, internal fertilization. They have a better circulatory system, um, able to generate higher blood pressures, stronger heart. They have stronger lungs as the skin dries up and you can no longer conduct respiration through the skin. We talked about that with having a large surface area and fish use their gills, but as amphibians come onto land, um, the skin becomes sort of the place for uh, the site for respiration because it's so large, but that's not so good in terms of drying out. So reptiles um, evolutionarily with that dry skin, they have to have bigger and more efficient lungs because they're losing the ability to breathe through the skin for the most part. So better developed lungs, uh, better water conservation, uh, more efficient kidneys. Also important if you're going to live on land, if you live in the water, water is not difficult to get usually. So frogs, um, and salamanders, their kidneys can afford to be less efficient, uh, because of the amount of water they're around. Reptiles need a more efficient, um, kidney, uh, better body support. I mentioned that sort of right angle thing that you see in salamanders In reptiles. Um, the legs are, are, are there, there's more structural support and they're moving more underneath the animal, not quite as well as we see in mammals yet, uh, but better than you see in frogs. Uh, and the nervous system is becoming more complex, um, larger brains and things of that sort as we progress through our evolutionary tree. So once again, uh, we have several groups, but we're still in the same phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, superclass nathostomata, just like we did before. And then this is one of those things, you know, I, I, we've done this several times where the, uh, there, there's a taxonomy by which we name things. And um, long story short, we'll, we'll go into this a little bit more as we go. There's a big problem with where you, you're going to put birds in. Uh, are birds reptiles? And do you put them in with a reptile group or are they their own thing? Um, if you take almost any kid and ask them um, which of these things are reptiles and which are not, um, birds are kind of their own weird thing. Um, in some ways. So the class reptilia, there really isn't a class reptilia. I put it in there because we call all these things reptiles commonly, but each one really will have its own class. Again, this is a made up system by humans. The animals are out there existing and don't really care what we call them really. Uh, so class reptilia is not really a real recognized scientific class among many biologists. So we'll just go into the different classes and maybe we call, um, this a, um, clade, you know, maybe it's clade reptilia and we'll talk about what you could do with that. And even maybe that's a, a little bit of a problem depending on where you put birds. So let's talk about, each of these groups as we go. Now, before we go too far though, we have to talk about the difference in some skull types. Okay. So we have several different skull types 
that uh, come up in evolutionary history. And the first is what we call an, an anapsid skull, which means there's no, it's, it's a solid plate of bones. And this was thought originally to be a very ancestral type of skull. And that later we evolved these uh, holes in the side of the skull, not into the brain, but rather these arches, if you will, that allowed for more muscle attachment. Um, new evidence suggests maybe that turtles, um, that that skull is newer than what we originally thought. And we'll talk about that. Um, and, and I'll show you turtles are kind of a, they're a weird group and people don't really sometimes know where to put them anyway. But the anapsid skull essentially means there's no gap, it's solid bone there. And when you look at a turtle skull, you can see that. A diapsid skull is what you find in the other reptiles. And what you see on the side of the skull is you see these two holes. Uh, they look like, um, well, they look like holes. They look like spaces. Um, now, they're not holes in the sense that they go into the brain. There's still bone there. So really what's important is there's an arch here. Now, if you, lay, if you look at a, a mammal skull, which is this one here, we have a synapsid skull. That, that arch that you can see there, you can actually feel on the side of your face here. So if you feel your cheekbone, right? If you have your eye and you work your way back along your cheekbone there, you can feel this bone and then you can feel this soft spot where you have muscle attached. And if you go above that on your temple and you bite your teeth down, you can feel that muscle move. Um, that in a sense is, is the same thing you have, but in a diapsis skull, you have two of those spaces. We have one large one. And again, you're not going into the brain. You're giving more room for muscle attachment. Um, so that's uh, your masseter and your temporalis muscles in the human jaw which are very, very strong muscles are located in these regions and, and take advantage of those attachment sites uh, there. So those skulls are often are what are used to sort of separate the uh, different reptiles and mammals and so forth as we go, okay? So the synapse skull, like you see, like I said right there, is um, what we see in therapsid uh, animals, which are a group that led to mammals, okay? And there's my turtles and others. Okay. Now you'll see right here, I was talking about um, a couple of different things. Where are you going to put reptiles? Where do they go? And you'll notice on, on many of these cladograms, here's my test students, my turtles, right? And it comes down and they're like, yeah, we're going to put it, uh, we're going to put it where? Where are we going to put that thing? Um, is it an anapsid skull? Um, it used to be, uh, prior to maybe 10 years ago or so, it was definitely over here as its own thing. Uh, so people debate where that goes. And then you look over here, here's our, we'll talk about the squamata, which are lizards and snakes over here. So there's my squamata and here, here's our problem. So we've got a, we got a reptile there and a reptile, we've got extinct ones. So those are extinct and they don't exist anymore. Um, so that's okay there. And there's my crocodile. So we know about crocodiles. Uh, and then we have birds. Here's our birds, right? And then other dinosaurs that went extinct. But the, the problem people have is that the, if you look at how these things are related, the crocodiles and the birds are more closely related than the crocodile is to the turtle or the lizards or the snakes. And historically, if you took herpetology, which is the study of reptiles and amphibians, you learned about reptiles and amphibians and reptiles included uh, things like the sphenodontia, which we'll talk about, um, the crocodiles, uh, the snakes and the lizards um, and the turtles and then the amphibians. But that was it. And if you learn, if you took uh, 
ornithology, you learned about birds, and that was a separate group, totally separate thing. So um, historically teaching them, those were separate groups, but the evolutionary evidence suggests that birds and crocodiles are more closely related than they are to the other groups. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why that is, which are kind of interesting. So uh, first we'll talk about the testudines, also called chelonia, and the turtles uh, have a shell. And that's the most obvious thing about a turtle, I think, that you would notice. And they have two parts to the shell, the top of the shell called the carapace, and then the bottom of the shell called the plastron. So carapace on top, plastron on the bottom. And there are both land turtles and sea turtles, um, but, but they all evolved from a land chordate turtle and some returned to the water um, as sea turtles. The largest of those is the leatherback sea turtle, which gives a very big 2,000 pounds. Um, so, uh, and then we have the Galapagos tortoise and, and others. And uh, all of the turtles have to return to land, even if they live in the ocean or in fresh water, to lay their eggs. Uh, turtles don't, whoops, went too far. Turtles don't have any teeth. So evolutionarily, they've, uh, along the way, their, their teeth are not developed uh, in sockets like we'll see in other animals. Uh, fish before them had teeth. Turtles along the way have lost their teeth, plus have a bunch more adaptations. Um, but um, although they don't have teeth, um, they have a very often a very razor sharp uh, um, beak where the top and the bottom can slide past each other like scissors. So although they have no teeth, you don't go sticking your hand in an alligator snapping turtle's mouth or you'll lose your fingers or your hand or whatever you put in there. Um, most of the turtles, because they have that hard outside shell, uh, they move their legs in part to breathe. So in order to breathe, you have to expand and contract the lungs. And if you're a turtle, the rib cage surrounds the animal and is fused together as a solid bone structure. And then there's the scales on the outside of that. The scoots are the outside uh, scales um, that are on the plaster and the carapace. And that doesn't move, that, that's not very flexible. So in order for a turtle to breathe, they often have to move their legs. That makes the body bigger or smaller on the inside. And many of the turtles uh, have what we call temperature dependent sex, which means it's not dependent on genetics, but rather the temperature they're exposed to. What we find in turtles um, is there what we call a pattern one uh, temperature dependent sex pattern. I'll show you this um, in a minute when I show you lizards. Um, where at low temperatures, you tend to get males, and as temperatures go up, you tend to get females. Uh, this group here is called the Sphenodontia. They're called Tuataras. Uh, there's two living species, both found in New Zealand, um, and they look very much like a lizard. If you don't know any better, even if you know um, about them, they look very much like a lizard. But they're not a true lizard, they're their own group. They have a couple of differences. They have different teeth and they have no external ear. And they have this unusual eye that's on the top uh, through the skin. It's a well-developed eye below the skin. Not a lot is known about it. Uh, they think it's used kind of like our pineal gland to sense light and dark. I don't think it sees images per se, but it has this third sort of eye that is probably light sensitive to tell light from dark, and it probably is related evolutionarily to our pineal gland. Uh, so it's a, a primitive sort of Mesozoic reptile, again, only found in New Zealand. Um, you can't find them anywhere else in the world, and New Zealand does a good job of, of protecting them, so you can't just go visit them. You gotta get permits and everything to um, see them, um, even, you know, I'm not sure you can even get permits now to see them. But anyway, they're only found on a couple of small islands um, in New Zealand. Um, and not quite reptiles. I mean, they are reptiles, but not quite lizards or an own group, but they look kind of like lizards. 
Then we have, of course, the squamata, which are the lizards and the snakes. And the there's there's many of them um, in this group, geckos, iguanas, and a variety of them. This is my favorite group of them of all. Um, for the most part, you can tell lizards from snakes pretty easily in the sense that you might think, well, you know, lizards have legs and snakes don't have legs. But uh, there are some lizards that don't have legs, legless lizards. In fact, we have a endangered one in California, the California legless lizard, um, which, you know, you'll see every now and then. They're very hard to find and they're endangered. There are, you know, they, they dig through the soil and that kind of thing. And, and, and there's a couple of snakes that have sort of the remnants, if you will, of a hip bone. But in general, snakes don't have any legs. Um, but there are some lizards that don't have any legs. And for the most part, um, they have these movable eyelids. They can blink. Lizards can blink. Snakes, their eyelids don't move. They're fused. They have eyelids. They're fused, closed, and they're clear. So they're seeing through their eyelid. Um, and it offers protection for the eye. But there are also lizards that have that same sort of eye that the eyelid doesn't move, it doesn't close. Um, so that makes it hard. So in a nutshell, there's no one characteristic that is easy to separate lizards from snakes. Um, they have paired copulatory organs, so they can um, produce uh, sperm and fertilize both of the oviducts in the female. Um, and there are a variety of them, and they usually, the lizards at least uh, have a tongue that's usually not bifurcated, where in the snakes it usually is, but there's exceptions to that. Bifurcation means it splits like that. So I'll show you in a better picture when I have a picture rather than my drawing. But anyway, if this is the tongue of the snake, so here's your snake. This is just gonna get worse probably. But anyway, here's your snake here. All right, and, and the tongue sticking out this way um i'm gonna stop there on that part okay anyway bifurcated tongue lizards usually don't have that there's a couple of groups that do um but snakes tend to do do have that and the jaw in a snake and a lizard both but primarily in a snake is it, it's loosely connected to the skull it's very flexible we'll get into that in a second there are a couple of interesting, both snakes and lizards, that undergo, we talked about this once before, it's called parthenogenesis, where there are, there are groups that they've found of lizards, for example, and they've done the same thing with snakes, where there's only uh, females um, in a population. There, there's no males of this one species. And there's, th this happens, um, Occasionally in nature, we have found these examples where there are females that can reproduce uh, in a couple of different ways in which even if there's no males, they can reproduce without the presence of a male and make a like a copy of themselves. So interestingly, what they found in this case is that this species here um, in which there's only females really results, this one here results by a crossbreeding of these two. So this is species one, this is species two, and they occasionally will cross and the result ends up being this individual, which is its own reproductively sort of isolated female that can reproduce and make new individuals uh, without a male in that case, which is kind of interesting. Some of the squamata also have temperature dependent sex. So remember I was telling you about the turtle, uh, the, um, the percentage of males, right? So if the temperature was low, uh, you got lots of males, right? This is low temperature, this is high temperature. That was pattern one. Pattern two is what you see mainly in snakes and lizards and crocodiles and other things where it's sort of the opposite, where if the temperature's low, you get um, more females, 
right? So this is low temperature, high temperature. And if the percentage of males is low, that means the percentage of females is higher, okay? So think of it like that, low temperature, high temperature. And if, at, if you're at a low temperature, the percent of males that you get in pattern one, which are like turtles, is high, okay? And in some cases, you have this pattern too where it actually, it, it, it changes. So there's, it's like a bell-shaped curve. Um, but either way, um, temperature-dependent sex, okay? Now, a bunch of different lizards. This is one that we uh, have to learn in lab that we have around us here. It's called a Western skink. Has this bright blue tail, which is very noticeable even in the picture. It uses that to um, fool predators. That tail can break off and it'll flop around and the lizard will run off and that bright blue tail distracts a would-be predator um, and the lizard can run off and escape. Uh, this is a, a horned lizard, another one we have in class. Um, as an example, primarily an ant eating type. And then uh, we're not maybe going on our trip, unfortunately, this time, but when we go to the Living Desert Museum um, out in Palm Desert, uh, we can see Gila monsters, uh, which is another group of lizards. It's one of three of the venomous lizards, including the Mexican beaded lizard. And recently, maybe 10 years ago, they've added the Komodo dragon to that list. Um, there's also um, protein that are found in the saliva that you find in these Gila monsters that are being used to develop new drugs to treat diabetes. Okay, and snakes then, so those are more lizards, um, and then snakes, as you know, lack limbs and they lack movable eyelids. Uh, but again, you have lizards that fall in that group on occasions as well. Uh, lizards, I mean, snakes have a bifurcated tongue. There you go, see, that's what I was trying to draw. Here's my snake, there's a bifurcated tongue. My drawing looks just like that. And you know that's true, so we'll just move on. Bifurcated tongue, and they have a Jacobson's organ uh, in their um, mouth, near the near the front of their mouth. Uh, when they take that tongue back in, they can sense chemicals that have landed on the bifurcated tongue, and they can determine where an animal is, right or left, based on the smell. Many of them also have L'Oreal pits, such as our pit vipers, and they can sense heat. Uh, so this is an interesting study. Uh, some groups up at UC Davis have been studying squirrels and rats. Um, and in this particular area, they can adjust the amount of heat that they're producing in their tail um, by, by sending more heat to the tail or not. And they can use that to distract uh, predators and they do that differently if it's a um, a a reptile uh, or if it's a yeah if it's if they're if the squirrel is being attacked by a pit viper such as one of our rattlesnakes uh, they will do this behavior they'll send uh, more blood it seems to the tail which makes the tail more obvious to distract the um, pit viper, but then they don't do that for a gopher snake, for example. So it's interesting because these squirrels seem to be able to tell the difference between the two different types of snakes and have a different strategy for them. Uh, in terms of venom, you, you often hear about people being afraid of snakes because they're afraid they're venomous and they're going to get hurt and they're going to die. Um, uh, there are snakes that can be dangerous in as a general rule in the united states uh particularly in california most of our snakes are not particularly dangerous um there are some but as a good general rule most of the snakes you're going to come across um are not particularly uh if you know it's not a rattlesnake if it's a rattlesnake and it's rattling in california um, then obviously that's a rattlesnake. So it's kind of easy to tell many of our venomous snakes from non-venomous snakes in California. Now, that's not true around the world. I'll get to that here in a second. So there are really two sort of uh, big groups of venomous snakes. 
Um, there's the Viperidae, which are the folding fang snakes like our uh, rattlesnakes, which fold their fangs out and inject their venom, as you know about rattlesnakes. And then there's another group that are really, they're not very common here in the United States, but you find the Elapidae more in, say, Australia and Africa. And they're more of a fixed front fang snake. So the fangs are shorter, uh, not as long. They don't fold, but they're fixed in place. And that includes things like cobras and sea snakes and coral snakes. And um, the so there's the there's the methodology by which the reptile delivers the venom, but then the venom itself can contain a bunch of different kinds of chemicals. And there are two sort of aspects of most venom that you should be aware of. One is a hemotoxic part, which causes tissue damage. And the other is a neurotoxic part, which causes nerve or neurological problems. What we tend to have in the United States and in particular in California, most of our snakes are either not venomous and if they are, they tend to have more hemotoxic venom components. So if you get bit, um, first of all, it's not likely to be poisonous or venomous. And it's likely if you do get bit by a rattlesnake, you're going to get tissue damage, which will look really bad, but most likely not result in death. Um, there's also a myth that if you had a really small snake, that's going to be worse. That's a well-proven myth that is not true. The bigger the snake, the more venom it can inject. So if it's the same species of snake, the smaller one is not more venomous. It's by far the bigger one. Um, but the if you travel, if you leave the United States and you go to Australia or Africa and you're just out looking for things and you find a snake and you just want to grab it and catch it, you get into scarier things because in, say, Australia, far more of the snakes in general tend to fall into this elapidae group and they tend to be far heavier in the neurotoxic venom category, which means that if you get bit, it may not look all that bad, but the fatality rate of things with neurotoxic venom is higher because it eventually can make you stop breathing and then you end up dying from it. Um, so California, you know, again, really not all that terrifying in terms of snake bites. Uh, Australia, far different. Um, you don't just grab snakes in Australia unless you know, you know what you're doing. Uh, that being said, you know, you don't see uh, Australia just being gone. You know, people are still there doing just fine. Uh, they just don't do stupid things like try to catch a rattlesnake. Well, they don't have rattlesnakes, but they don't try to catch uh, a snake uh, unless they know what it is and they leave it alone. And they're also, in general, very uh, uh, much better at treating venomous animal bites because they see them more commonly than we do in the United States, where we don't have nearly as many. But Anyway, so there you go. That's the Viperidae and the Elapidae. Um, this is actually a venomous snake here. It's a ring neck snake, um, but it's a small snake. I've even picked them up before, um, not knowing they're venomous. They're very tiny and tend to um, not bite, um, but uh, are technically venomous. And what the snakes have that is uh, useful is they, they have these teeth that are curved and pointed inward, they face backward, which allows them to sort of walk their way up the prey they're eating. And they have this hinged quadrate bone that you see here. And that allows their jaw to be very, very flexible. Um, there's also a myth that snakes can dislocate their jaw. That's how they eat things that are really large, but that's not quite true either. Um, instead, it's just very flexible. So it's a hinged quadrate bone. So rather than one point in it opening, it can, it can pivot there and there, which allows it to be very flexible, not dislocate, but it allows it to sort of expand far greater than what you would see 
in, say, the lizards. Uh, they have a movable palate. That's the roof of your mouth, so that can get out of the way. They have very elastic skin and no sternum. All those things allow them to eat large prey uh, and swallow it. Okay, and then we have the crocodiles, the class crocodilia and these are the crocodiles and the alligators uh, and these are the largest living reptiles uh, most closely related to dinosaurs which includes birds as we'll talk about uh, when we get to them they have a complete secondary palate which means the roof of their mouth is solid bone we haven't really seen that yet in the amphibians and the reptiles and the significance of that is it allows animals like crocodiles and us to breathe through their nose while having their mouth uh, either have food in it uh, or below the water. Um, and that's going to be important in a second. Now, the reason crocodiles and alligators are kind of unusual and, and, and they're put sort of uh, uh, evolutionarily, you'll see them on a chart related to birds, is that we believe that the crocodiles, although they look like a big old, you know, um, reptile that existed, you know, for millions of years, um, they probably most likely evolved from a small bird-like dinosaur at first. So it's not, the, the question isn't how do you get a bird from a crocodile because they seem so unrelated. It's the other way around. We start with a bird-like thing with no feathers. And over time, as those split, crocodiles became more like what we see now. So these probably didn't exist hundreds of millions of years ago, although they might look like it. They evolved from a small bird-like dinosaur and they have this unusual heart which is a, it's like other reptile hearts, but it has this connection between these two uh, valves here. And that valve can be opened and closed. So what a crocodile can do that's interesting is it can switch between sort of having the mechanics of a three chambered heart and that of a four chambered heart. And so on land, the four chambered heart is more efficient for higher metabolic rates and chasing animals and catching prey. Crocodiles hunt though by grabbing something and dragging into the water and they drown it. And when a crocodile is under the water, they can switch to this more efficient three chambered heart, which slows their metabolism down and allows them to stay underwater um, longer. Um, I might have told you this story already. Um, I don't know because you know you start losing your mind after a while. But I was in Australia, uh, my wife and I, and you know there I am, Tim Ravel, biology professor, and I go down by the water to take pictures of this fish that I saw. It's called a mud skipper, and it was down by the water. And I thought it was going to be really neat because you know I've seen them on TV. And now here they are in the wild and I'm down there right by the edge of the water taking pictures. And the guide, the tour guide, um, like grabs my shirt and pulls me back and he goes, what are you doing? I go, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm taking pictures of the mud skippers. And he kindly explained to me that I was an idiot because, um, right in that water, there can be a huge, you know, 2000 pound saltwater crocodile that if you're on the edge of the shore being a an american exercising your right to do whatever you want uh, they can grab you and and you'll be dead because if they grab a hold of you and drag you in the water there's essentially nothing they can do you can't they back up they go into the water and you can't see it anymore and they can hold their breath for a long period of time and they, they essentially drown you. So that didn't happen that day to me, obviously. But um, again, you know, things like that in Australia can be dangerous and you gotta follow the rules. Um, we're not used to that, especially in California. California is the worst because uh, we're not even afraid of the weather or anything like that. So anyway, crocodiles also have 
temperature dependent sex where uh, very much like the lizards, um, when you have higher temperatures, um, you get males. So low temperatures will give you females. Higher temperature gives you males. So they're like pattern two, if you will. Okay. Now, just quickly here, as we start going into moving into birds, uh, we'll talk about dinosaurs and, and most of the dinosaurs are extinct, as you know. And we have two groups of dinosaurs. One group we call the Cerisian dinosaurs and another group we call the Ornithischian dinosaurs. And then in that related group are the pterosaurs, which are neither of those groups there. They're their own unique group uh, of dinosaurs that are extinct. But of the pterosaurs, um, or, or sorry, of the dinosaurs, there are two groups, again, the Cerisian and the Ornithischian dinosaurs, and they are really different uh, by their hip structure. And what's going to be interesting is as we move through these groups, as we move into birds, we're going to find that the Cerisian dinosaur hip structure is going to very much match what we see in birds. So the, the birds um, are really, although the dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago, birds are really one of the groups of dinosaurs, of Cerisian dinosaurs that did not go extinct. And so the dinosaurs still live on in the form of birds. Okay. We'll go into birds next time. Uh, we'll end it there. Hope everyone's having a good day. Talk with you soon.